Today we are going to see the first domain of CICSP that is security and risk management. So let's begin. What is information security? Protection of information or assets from threat. This is a very simplified definition, but security involves many other aspects and principles. The three fundamental principles or the three pillars on which the security stand is CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability. Confidentiality is to maintain the secrecy of a data, integrity provides the accuracy and reliability. Availability is to make sure that the resource is accessible when it is required. Apart from these, we have other supporting fundamental principles which is called IAAA, Identification, Authentication, Authorization, Accountability. Identification provides the unique identity of a user, authentication acts as a proof of that identity, authorization assigns the permissions and accountability creates the liability. Let us see the example of these. Confidentiality can be achieved by using disk encryption, IPsec, TLS, SSH, non-disclosure agreement. Whereas the integrity can be achieved by hashing algorithm, file integrity monitoring tool like Tripwire. Availability can be achieved by using backup, load balancing and business continuity planning. Examples of identification are username, employee ID, credit card. We can prove these by using password, fingerprint, PIN number. Authorization can be achieved by using file permission, access control and by using a protocol like OAuth which is used to log into a site by using social network account or Gmail account. Accountability can be achieved by using logging and auditing so that in the case of event we can trace back to the source and find out that who is responsible for it. Now all these examples that we have seen are called the controls or the safeguards. We can divide or categorize these controls into three types. These are administrative, technical and physical. Some of the examples of administrative controls are policies, procedures, guideline, training, background verification. And technical controls are encryption, identity access management, security incident event management, security orchestration, automation response, data loss prevention, cloud access security, broker IDS, firewall and backup. Physical controls are fencing, guards, CCTV. Now these controls have different functionalities. These functionalities are preventive, detective, corrective, deterrent, recovery and compensating. We can relate some of these controls to these functionalities like this. Here we can see that for preventive we use DLP and CASB to prevent data loss. For detective we use SIM to detect any security incident. For corrective we use backup in case some file has been damaged we can restore with the backup. For deterrent we use guards and CCTV so there won't be any intrusion. For recovery we using backup in case some data has been lost we can recover it. And for compensating that is the alternative safeguard. In case we don't have the guards we can compensate it with fencing and CCTV. To use multiple controls the best strategy is defense in depth. In that we use multiple layer of control like this. Here we have asset then we have system level controls like anti-malware, disk encryption then we have network level controls like firewall, VPN top of that we have physical controls like guards, fencing and the top layer is administrative control like policies, procedure, guideline. Now so far we have seen a lot of controls for security. Now the question is how do we manage that? To manage this we need some kind of management system and for that we use information security management system ISMS. We can implement our own ISMS or we can follow the international standard like ISO 27000 series. It is proposed by two organizations ISO and IEC. In that there are two well known standards. The one is 27001 other is 27002. 27001 provides us the requirements for the ISMS and 27002 gives the procedure to implement those controls based on the requirements given in 27001. There are other standards like NIST 800 series which is proposed by the National Institute of Standardization. In that, we have the standard NIST Special Publication 853 which provides the security and privacy control for government and federal agencies. NIST also provides the CSF cybersecurity framework which can be used for the smaller organization. There is also industry specific controls like PCI DSS, Payment Card Industry Data Security Standard which is used for the companies which use online payment or debit or credit card. These standards are security specific and we know that security is a part of IT. So we need some kind of system to manage overall IT infrastructure. So for that we can use a framework called COBIT. It is proposed by the ISECA. COBIT supports to organize and oversee all IT operations. We also need a system to manage IT services. For that we can use ITIL. It helps the IT teams to organize its daily tasks. All these standards and frameworks are used within an enterprise. An enterprise is made up of many elements and we need to understand the relation between these elements to use these standards and frameworks effectively. For that we need enterprise architecture. This can be designed by using a framework called judgment framework. It's one of the oldest framework. It used two dimension approach. In one dimension it asks the interrogative questions. Other dimension we have the different perspectives like contextual from the executive point of view, conceptual from the manager, architectural from the architect, technological from the engineer, implementation from the technician and enterprise wide give us the overall view. Same as this one we have TOGF which is the open group architecture framework. It uses architecture development method which provides the process to plan, design, implement and manage an enterprise architecture. So far we have seen fundamental principles, control, ISMS, framework, standards. Now the question is, who have decision making power regarding these and overall security of an organization? There are two approaches. 
top down and bottom up in top down the decision making start from the board member and senior executive whereas the bottom up start from the technical team it's not recommended so it's not used anymore in this the decision making flow something like this ceo cio cso security consultant security architect engineer analyst the responsibility of board members and senior executive is to direct and control security activities of an organization and to make sure that the security objectives should align with the business objectives these tasks are called as security governance we can also define security governance as the set of responsibilities and practices exercised by executive management with the goal of providing strategic direction ensuring that the objectives are achieved ascertaining that the risks are managed appropriately and verifying that the enterprise resources are used responsibly now one of the way to achieve the strategic direction is by having the well defined documentation of policies procedures guidelines standards and baseline policies are the directives from senior management in the form of statements these statements are set of rules and instruction to achieve security goals some of the example of security policies are acceptable use policies access control policy password policy remote access policy procedures are the step by step instruction to implement a policy examples are like step to perform data classification step to create a vpn connection for remote access to implement a remote access policy Guidelines are the recommendation of best practices to achieve security goal. Examples are guidelines to keep work tasks clean for cyber hygiene, guidelines that what information can be shared with a stranger about company to prevent social engineering attacks. Standards are the mandatory instruction to be followed. Examples are access point using WPA3 enterprise mode, email communication using AES256. Here WPA3 enterprise is a standard and AES256 is a standard. Baseline is the minimum security configuration or setting that must be followed. It's the bottom line of a security. We cannot go below that, but we can create a security on top of that. For example, password should be at least 8 character long. It means we can't have the password 7 character, we can have the password 10 characters or 14 characters. From the definition we can see that all these are derived from the policies. Having good policies is a sign of good governance. Having all these in place is a part of due care. It means taking reasonable action to secure an organization now having all these is not enough we have to make sure that they are implemented properly for that we have to perform audit and improve these on a regular basis this is called due diligence it is also called as sustaining the due care it means the action taken in due care should be maintained and improved over the time these two also help to avoid the liability in case of incident this liability can also be arise due to some laws and regulations in case of negligence the company might have to pay heavy cost These laws and regulation also influence these documentation so it's important that we understand these laws and regulation some of these laws and regulations are Computer Fraud and Abuse Act it is one of the oldest US based law it covers the computer crime across states and it makes unauthorized access illegal then there is a Federal Information Security Management Act which makes the federal agency to follow the information security management then there is a Digital Millennium Copyright Act it protects the creative work of artist and also protects against any unauthorized duplication then there is also intellectual property laws which protects the intellectual properties like trademark which is a unique identity of a company or product it can be words slogan logos it is initially given for 10 years then it can be renewed then there are patents which can be made for the invention by the inventor it is given for 20 years after that the invention will be in the public domain then there is a trade secret which is essential and critical for the survival of the business these can be formula process model algorithm that's why the company use non disclosure agreement to protect their trade secret then there is a cram leach blyle act glba which is used to protect the information of customers of financial institutes like banks then there is a serbent soxley act socks it protects the interest of investors and making the corporate disclose accurate and reliable information so that the investor will not be misled then there is a general data protection regulation which is proposed by the european union it protects the privacy of european union citizens and it makes it mandatory to have the consent for collecting and processing personal identifiable information data subjects have the right to be informed or to be forgotten in case they are no longer using the service In case of the negligence of these guidelines as GDPR then there can be a fine up to 20 million euros or 4% of global turnover whichever is greater then there is a health insurance portability and accountability act HIPAA which protects the patient sensitive health information in the definition of security governance we have seen that one of the task is to ascertain that risk are managed appropriately this can be achieved by using a risk management so what is a risk it is a likelihood that a threat compromising a vulnerability so we can say that risk is a combination of threat and vulnerability so what is a threat it can be anything which have the potential to cause harm to our asset for example malware hackers natural disaster whereas the vulnerability is a weakness or a loophole for example in secure communication and on miss login no backup the process of risk management involves four stages identification analysis treatment and monitor risk identification you identify the potential risk for example data loss network intrusion disk failure internal attack flood this will be incomplete without finding the all possible threats for that we use threat modeling in this we identify categorize and prioritize threat we can identify the threat by using the model called stride This includes the threat of spoofing IP MAC address tampering and modifying intercepted data reputation by denying an act disclosing critical information performing a DOS attack elevating privilege to admin and root access we can categorize and prioritize threat on the basis of dread model in this 
We categorize threats based on how much damage it can cause, how easily it can be reproduced, how much it can exploit, how many users will be affected and how hard it is to discover. The risk analysis having two methods, quantitative and qualitative. Quantitative is a numerical approach. In this, we calculate the value of asset. This is called asset value. Let's say it is $10,000. Then we calculate how much asset will be exposed by a threat. It is called exposure factor, let's say 40%. Then we calculate that how much loss will be having when the threat happens one time. This is called single loss expectancy, SLE. This will be calculated by the multiplication of these two. So it will be 4,000. Now we calculate that how frequently that threat can happen. This is called annual rate of occurrence, ARO. It can be calculated in a numerical format like once in a year, twice in a year or once in a four year. Based on that, we can calculate that how much loss we'll be having in a single year. That is called annual loss expectancy. This will be calculated as a SLE into ARO. So it will come 8,000. To mitigate this risk, we use a safeguard. So let's say we use a safeguard of $200. After using the safeguard, the exposure factor will reduce to 5%. Now the SLE will be 500 and ALE will be 1000. Now we can see that before the safeguard, we have lost 8000. Now after the safeguard, we have lost only 1000. Now we can calculate the cost benefit by subtracting this and the cost of the safeguard. So it will come around 6800. So we are saving 6800. Now in case the safeguard is say 7000, then we will be having zero cost benefit. In that case, we will not be using that safeguard and we will accept that risk. Qualitative analysis is based on the scenarios. Like if there is a vulnerability, then what threat can happen, how much damage it can cause. In this, we use different methods like discussing in the form of story, conducting survey, going through the checklist, conducting interviews or Delphi techniques. In Delphi techniques, we use anonymous feedback from the group members. In risk treatment, we respond to the risk in four ways. Either we reduce or mitigate the risk by using appropriate safeguard like antivirus firewall ideas, or we assign or transfer the risk in the form of insurance or outsourcing or we can accept the risk if there is no cost benefit. This is also called as residual risk. Or we can ignore the risk. Ignoring risk means no due care has been taken. It is also created the high liability. The last one is risk monitoring review. As we know that there is a possibility of new threats and vulnerability. So it is important that we reassess the risk on a periodic basis. Now what if something goes wrong after using all the security measures and risk management? In that case, we need a plan to keep the business running. For that, we can use the business continuity planning. BCP involves the five stages. Project scope and planning, business impact analysis, continuity planning, approval and implementation documentation. In project scope and planning, we analyze the organization structure. In this, we find out that what are the departments and people to be involved. Then we create the team. Then we assess the resources that are required. Then we look at the laws and regulation which can affect our planning. In business impact analysis, we identify the business priorities to find out the which process are more critical. Then we identify the risk. Then we conduct likelihood assessment based on ARO, impact assessment based on ALE, and then we allocate the resources. In continuity planning, we create a strategy based on BIA. Then we create a procedure. In procedure, we have to make sure that the safety is given to the people, then to the facility, then to the infrastructure. Then we have approval implementation. In this, we get the plan approval from the top management. Then we implement the plan and then we conduct the training awareness for the people involved in the BCP. Then at last, we have the documentation. It is act as a reference in the event of emergency and it also provides the historical record for improvement. So that's all for today. See you next time.